Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Native Prairie Appreciation Week uh, webinar series. My name is Carolyn Gannett, and I am the manager of the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. This week is Native Prairie Appreciation Week. Saskatchewan is the only jurisdiction in North America that proclaims Native Prairie Appreciation Week, which is devoted to raising awareness and appreciation of native grasslands. It is jointly proclaimed by the Saskatchewan Ministries of Agriculture and Environment, as well as the cities of Regina, Saskatoon, Weyburn, and Moose Jaw. I'd like to start by stating that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. I am currently on Treaty 4 territory, as I am in Regina. Uh, Treaty 4 is an agreement signed by the Crown in the Plains Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Assiniboine peoples to share their traditional territories with non-Indigenous peoples. Further, we acknowledge um, the Métis peoples of the communities of Fort Coppell, Labret, Lestock, and Willow Bunch, who identify this region as their homeland. And I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada and Saskatchewan today. Um, so if you're not on Treaty 4 territory, we ask that you think of the land that you're on, learn about the treaties, and consider your connection to the land. Now this afternoon's webinar is the stewards of Saskatchewan getting to know our prairie species at risk with Rachel Ward and Carmen LaBelle from Nature Saskatchewan. Before Rachel and Carmen get started, I'll just uh, mention a few housekeeping items. Um, all of our Native Prairie Appreciation Week presentations are recorded and will be available on PCAP's YouTube channel. You just have to search YouTube for SK PCAP and you should find it in over a hundred of our recorded webinars. If you have any questions during the presentation in the webinar pop-up, there is a place to type in questions um, and I'll moderate the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but feel free to type in your question during the presentation as you think of them. And just a reminder that there's still the Native Prairie photo contest going on on PCAP's Facebook page. Uh, you have until 5 p.m. on Friday the 18th to vote for your favorite photos in the three different categories. Um, I would also like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by Rachel Ward and Carmen LaBelle from Nature Saskatchewan. And we really appreciate that Rachel and Carmen uh, were able to do this presentation for everyone today. Now a bit about our presenters. If you wanna turn on your webcams now, you can, but you don't have to. Um, Carmen has grown up in Saskatchewan and graduated in the fall of 2019 from the, the University of Regina with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography, a Certificate in Sustainability, and with additional focuses in Geography and Geographical Information Systems. Rachel Ward grew up in Calgary, Alberta, and completed a Bachelor of Science at the University of Calgary with a double major in Zoology and Ecology, and is pursuing a career in conservation. I think you've got a good start. <laughs> Both Rachel and Carmen will be working for Nature Saskatchewan this summer as habitat stewardship assistants. And with that, I will uh, disappear and pass over control to uh, Rachel to get started. Okay, so Rachel, you're still on mute if you're trying to um, talk. There you go. Thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. As you said, I'm Rachel and Carmen will be talking a little bit later. Uh, so we are going to be introducing you to some of our prairie species at risk today.
So at Nature Saskatchewan, our vision is humanity in harmony with nature. And our mission is to engage and inspire people to appreciate, learn about, and protect Saskatchewan's natural environment. Nature Saskatchewan is Saskatchewan's largest volunteer driven nonprofit naturalist organization with over 70 years of observing, documenting, and working to protect native species and natural ecosystems. We deliver numerous education and stewardship programs and have approximately 600 members and 16 affiliated nature societies. At Stu Stewards of Saskatchewan Habitat Conservation through Land Owner Stewardship, our program goals are to conserve prairie habitat through landowner stewardship, monitor populations, increase awareness and knowledge, and to promote habitat enhancement and restoration. We are conserving habitat suitable for target species at risk and other wildlife species through voluntary landowner stewardship. We have 930 participants conserving over half a million acres of species at risk habitat. Our population monitoring is done in a few ways. So first we mail out census cards annually to participating landowners. You can see that on the left there. So they record any species that they've seen on their properties, how many, all that information and send those back to us. We also have our hoot line for sightings from the general public. If you see a species at risk, you can call that number there. And we also do plant searches for rare plants. Those are conducted by the rare plant rescue team for target species. So with the permission of landowners, the search crews will survey the land to seek out target rare plant species. And this has managed to find previously unknown occurrences of some of those target species. And there's also regular population monitoring of known locations through existing participants. This data with landowner permission is shared with the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center and the rare plant rescue data has contributed to downlisting of several species, which I will be mentioning later. The plovers on shore data has contributed to critical habitat ID and about 50% of the data that they have on burrowing owls actually comes from the Nature Saskatchewan Operation Burrowing Owl. For education and awareness, that's done through news releases and articles, ads and posters, and through public presentations, either in person or right now online throughout the province. We also create resources for landowners like fact sheets, booklets, and a species at risk newsletter and calendar, as well as hosting conservation awareness days, which is what's pictured there. For habitat enhancement, we are working to improve and enhance habitat for burrowing owls, sprogs, pipits, and piping plovers. This is done through a 50-50 cost share with the landowner or manager for native seeding, wildlife-friendly fencing, or alternate water sources. The wildlife-friendly fencing is pictured on the top left there, and it has a smooth bottom and top wire with the highest wire 40 inches or less off the ground and the lowest wire 18 inches or more off the ground. With those top two wires no less than 12 inches apart, this allows pronghorns to crawl under the fence and deer to get over the fence without getting tangled. So it helps to prevent wildlife injuries as well as damage to fencing. And the alternate water sources provide offsite watering. This helps to reduce disturbance to piping plover habitat during breeding season. And it can also help landowners graze a pasture that they weren't able to as easily without that water source. So we have five stewardship programs. Our oldest program is Operation Burrowing Owl, which was started in 1987. Then in 2002, the Rare Plant Rescue program was started, followed by Shrubs for Shrikes in 2003, Plovers Onshore in 2008, and in 2010, we started the Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program, which protects all species at risk. So what is a species at risk? 
Species at risk are plants or animals that are in jeopardy of disappearing from the wild. These are assessed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or COSIWIC, who is a national panel of experts who determine what species are in danger of disappearing. They then pass this recommendation along to the federal government, which may incorporate those species into the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, which is federal legislation that protects species at risk. So species can have several designations, including the ones pictured on the right, as well as data deficient, which is a category that applies when there's not enough available information to determine if the species is at risk or not, as well as not at risk, which is a species that is not at risk of extinction. The ones pictured here are the ones that make up species at risk. So a species of special concern is a wildlife species that may become threatened or endangered because of a combination of biological characteristics and identified threats. A threatened species is a wildlife species that is likely to become endangered if nothing is done to reverse the factors leading to its extirpation or extinction. An endangered species is a wildlife species facing imminent extirpation or extinction. An extirpated species is a species that no longer exists in a given area, for example, Canada, and an extinct wildlife species no longer exists. So our first program is our Operation Burrowing Owl, or OBO. This was initiated, as I said, in 1987 and currently has 336 participants protecting approximately 162,000 acres and its target species is the burrowing owl. So the burrowing owl is an endangered species. It's also known as the ground owl or prairie bobber and it makes a cuckoo call which sounds like this. So that's their call sound. And despite the name, they actually do not dig burrows. Burrowing owls rely on burrows that have been dug by mammals such as badgers, ground squirrels, and prairie dogs. Burrowing owls can be identified by a variety of characteristics. They are nine inches tall. They have light and dark brown mottled plumage with white spots, large yellow eyes, and white eyebrows. They have a rounded head with no ear tufts and long featherless legs. The males and females do look alike. The males can be lighter from sun bleaching because they are out hunting while the females are in the burrow incubating. So they might be a bit lighter in color. And juveniles have a solid buffy colored chest on them. So that's how you can distinguish those. The bird most commonly mistaken for the burrowing owl is the short-eared owl. It nests on the ground and is approximately 15 inches tall, so it is larger than the burrowing owl, and it has dark patches around the eyes with short ear tufts that are sometimes visible, as you can see pictured there. You can see it also has a streaked breast, whereas the burrowing owl has that modeling. And you can't see it in the picture there, but they do have feathered legs as well. Burrowing owls can be found in open, well-drained grasslands, steeps, deserts, and agricultural land. In Canada, they are here for breeding season, so they'll be in areas that are good for nesting, which have open areas of short vegetation. This means that they do very well with grazed land, as you can see in that top picture there that we took this week. They do like to be in pastures that are grazed. They also need an abundance of burrows and nearby wetlands and tall undisturbed vegetation that helps with prey availability. Okay, you can see in the map, there, the darkest gray is the historical range for the burrowing owl. And then the light gray is the most recent one in 2004. So it, the range has shrunk quite a bit. They're not 
really found much in Manitoba anymore. The current COSIWIC estimate from, or most recent from 2015, estimates that owl populations in Canada are as low as only 270 owls, and around 100 of those are thought to breed in Saskatchewan. Then they winter in Texas and Mexico from November to March. And if you look in the photo on the left there, you can see those are juveniles because they have that solid buffy colored chest that I was talking about there. Burrowing owls are generalist predators. So they will basically hunt anything that is small enough for them to catch, which includes insects, mice, voles, toads, salamanders, and snakes. They will usually hunt whatever is most available. So in the spring, they eat more mice and voles. And later in the summer, they rely more on grasshoppers, especially juvenile owls that are learning to hunt. So they do provide excellent pest control. If you happen to have a burrowing owl on your property, that is a good thing. The top picture there is showing a burrowing owl pellet. So the bones and fur and parts that they can't digest are regurgitated in that pellet. And then the lower photo is showing a cache that was found in a burrowing owl burrow. So as I said, they are excellent pest control. So burrowing owls are facing many threats, including loss of habitat. So land that is favored for nesting is also favored for crops. And less than 20% of native prairie remains, with recent studies suggesting it could be as low as 13%. Fragmented habitat also increases predation and limits movement for pairing and dispersal. They are also threatened by loss of food due to cultivation and loss of wetlands as well as pesticides. As I said, they don't dig their own burrows, so they do rely on burrowing mammals. So the loss of those is a threat as well. Many areas don't tolerate badgers and ground squirrels, so that leads to fewer burrows available for nesting and escape from predators. Some of those mammals, such as ground squirrels, do also provide alternative prey for the predators of burrowing owls and vehicle strikes. So the second most common cause of mortality is road mortality after predation. And juvenile owls often hunt for insects on roads, so they are partic particularly susceptible, as well as those roadside ditches are important foraging areas. As I mentioned, they like that tall undisturbed vegetation for that foraging. So those roadsides are important as well. Our next program is the Rare Plant Rescue, or RPR. This was initiated in 2002 and has 83 participants protecting approximately 148,000 acres. There are 16 target plant species, nine of which are federally listed, and we will be going over briefly today. I will not be going into all the different ID characteristics for the plants because that requires some background and we won't have time for that today, but I'll give you a brief overview of each. So on the left we have buffalo grass, which is a species of special concern. This one forms golden patches in August and it was downlisted with the help of the RPR data. In the middle we have dwarf woolly heads, which is also a species of special concern. They are quite small, they're only about a couple centimeters. And then on the right, we have our hairy prairie clover, which is also special concern. And this one was also downlisted with help from the RPR data. Okay, on the left, we have Western spiderwort. This one is a threatened species. In the middle is smooth goosefoot, which is also threatened. And on the right, we have slender mouse ear cress, which is also threatened. On the left, we have small white lady slipper. So federally listed under Sarah, this is a threatened species. However, it is extirpated from Saskatchewan. So there are no known populations of the small white lady slipper currently within Saskatchewan. In the middle, we have tiny cryptantha, which is a threatened species. 
This one is also very tiny. In fact, the name means tiny hidden flower. And this one was also downlisted with help from RPR data. On the right there, we have our small flowered sand verbena, which is endangered. There are only 24 known populations in Canada. So these rare plants face a variety of threats, including habitat loss through cultivation, invasive weeds, stabilization of dune habitat. You might have noticed many of these plants have a sandy background, so they do need that dune habitat. Woody encroachment, urban development, and absence of natural processes, such as grazing and fire. Poaching is also a threat, especially for the orchid species like the lady slippers. So people are removing them from those naturally occurring spots and planting them in their own gardens and things like that. So I will now pass you off to Carmen who will be covering the next few programs. Uh, hi guys, thank you, Rachel. Um, again, my name is Carmen and I will be going through the next three stewardship programs Nature Saskatchewan has to offer. Um, first one, Shrubs for Shrikes, or SFS. It was initiated in 2003, currently has 275 participants with 119,000 acres. Uh, target species is the loggerhead shrike. The loggerhead shrike, uh, Sarah's status, is threatened. They are a raptorial songbird, or a songbird who thinks they're a hawk. Their other names can be butcherbird or thornbird, due to their prey impalements typically on barbed wire or thorns. Their name has two parts, loggerhead refers to their large head compared to their body, and a shrike because of their high-pitched shriek when alarmed. For example, uh, for key shrike identification, look for their wide black eye mask that extends past both of their eyes as well as their hooked beak, which can be pictured clearly in the top photo, um, as well as the white bar on their wing, which is seen during the flight, as in the bottom photo. Of course, they can also too be identified um, as being smaller than a robin, have a large head, <laughs> uh, and they have a gray back, a white chest, mostly black wings with that white bar, and has a black tail with white stripes. Uh, two of their lookalikes are the Northern Shrike, who's slightly larger, has brown barring on the chest, eye mask that covers half the eye and is broken over the beak compared to the loggerhead shrike. And then we have the Eastern Kingbird off to the right. Um, they are they have a dark gray upper part of their body feathers and a white under part. They have a black cap, black tail with a white tip, and does not have a hooked beak. Shrikes are found in areas with shrubs and trees, such as shelter belts near pastures and croplands. They prefer thorny shrubbery, such as hawthorns and buffalo berry. Other common areas they are found in are golf courses and cemeteries. Uh, this map from Environment Canada shows how the former range of the loggerhead shrike has decreased. The 2015 recovery strategy says 36,600 individuals are in Saskatchewan, 15,000 individuals in Alberta, and only 70 individuals in Manitoba. The loggerhead shrikes move 
to southern Texas, northern Mexico areas for their wintering grounds during the month, months of October through February. Their diet consists of uh, insects, rodents, reptiles, amphibians, and sometimes small birds. They use the impalement strategy because it is good for storage. They help attract mates before the breeding season and they aid in eating. Again, these shrikes think that they are hawks, yet they don't have the talons for impaling, so this makes it easier for them to eat. Some of the threats that they face is habitat loss and degradation due to conversion to croplands and the removal of shelter belts and old farmsteads. Others are pesticide use and road mortality. Our next steward program is Plovers on Shore or POS. It was initiated in 2008 and we currently have 60 participants with 137 miles of shoreline. The target species is the piping plover. In the picture, I, uh, I hope you can see the baby chick in front of the adult. They're pretty camouflaged. The piping plover has a Sarah status of endangered. They are a small migratory shorebird and are most commonly first heard um, before being seen due to their distinct sound. For example, so a lot of times that's how you can identify them first and you have to search around real hard to see them. They are the first in Saskatchewan to have designated critical habitat, meaning a habitat's area is essential to the conservation of the listed species. Their key identifying features are a black headband, an orange beak tipped with black, a single black neck band, and they have a white belly with a pale sandy gray back with orange legs. Their coloring and size make them camouflaged into their environment. And their chicks are also very camouflaged. Again, I hope you can find them and be able to spot them in the bottom photo. The piping plover's main lookalike is the killdeer. Its features though are an all black beak, two black neck bands, red around their eyes, rusted colored legs instead of orange like the plovers and are in general an overall darker brown body color. For their habitat, they inhibit freshwater beaches, alkali flats, and sand flats. Their breeding area are therefore open and has sparse vegetation. Thus, their nests are exposed and out in the open, but are camouflaged into the surrounding pebbles, as in the bottom right corner. The adult plovers will perform a broken wing behavior to lead predators away from the nests or their young. And they feed on fresh water invertebrates. Their distribution on the prairies can be seen in the brown on this map, mostly in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and a little area in Manitoba. They spend their wintering grounds in the Alabama, Florida areas, as well as the Gulf of Mexico during the months of September through to March. This endangered species has many threats up against them. One being predation through, sorry, from coyotes, 
foxes, raccoons, skunks, hawks, gulls, and crows. The weather and water level fluctuations both affect nest success. From nest flooding, as well as if water levels quickly decrease, it may decrease prey availability. There's also human disturbance from dogs off leash, ATVs or trucks. Um, again, the nests are very camouflaged and therefore make it easy for them to be driven over. There's also threats due to developments along the shorelines and human littering attracting predators. Rachel mentioned earlier in our habitat enhancement area that livestock can be a real, um, a real threat to plovers. Um, due to their ruts from cattle, uh, they can be lethal to the young plovers looking for food. And finally, the vegetation encroachment. Uh, the piping plovers can only tolerate 50% vegetation. Finally, we have our latest program, the Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program, or SOS. It was initiated in 2010, currently has 176 participants with 91,000 acres, and the target species is all other species at risk. Today, though, I'll only be going over four different species for you. First, we have the Sprague's pipit, who has a status of threatened. It can be ID'd by having brown and white streaked plumage, a thin bill and relatively large brown eyes, a necklace of short streaks that can be nicely seen in the middle photo, and their tail is brown and white with outer feathers. These are the Goldilocks of our province. Their habitat has to be just right, not too tall and dense, nor too short and sparse. A native mixed grass prairie is very important in blocks of 64 or greater hectares. By knowing this, they are a really good indicator of ecosystem health. They are rarely seen on the ground, even though their nest is on the ground and mostly they are only identified by their song, which can be sung up to 100 meters high for up to three hours. Here, I'll play a short example. They're in decline due to the obvious of habitat loss and fragmentation, climate change, but also by the spreading of invasive species, haying during br the breeding season, and the use of pesticides. Next is the ferruginous hawk, which has a status of threatened as well. It is the largest hawk in Saskatchewan and the only summer hawk with feathers all the way to their toes. You can identify them by their broad wings with rounded tips, their bright yellow smile, and they do have two color morphs, one being the lighter morph, which is um, pictured here. I uh, have the white underbelly, head and tail with brown upper feathers and an orange cinnamon markings on the back and under wings. And their legs are rusted colored, so it looks like they're wearing pants. The dark morph is more rare and it has a dark brown on the upper or on both upper and under parts of their body, with the underside of their wings being lighter in color. There are two lookalikes that I'll talk about today, one being the red-tailed hawk and it can be mainly distinguished by its darker belt across its belly. And then there is the Swainson's hawk, 
which has a dark hood and bib. The ferruginous hawk's habitat is uncultivated pasture land and native prairie. And they nest in isolated large trees or on ledges. Their diet relies heavily on ground squirrels, um, especially the Richardson ground squirrels. They are in decline because they are sensitive to habitat loss and degradation of the native prairie, as well as sensitive to human disturbances during their early nesting stages. There are also large fluctuation in prey numbers and storms can have a huge impact due to blowing down nests. The northern leopard frogs have a status of special concern. You can ID these guys by either being bright green or a muddy brown with a light belly. Both have prominent light colored dorsal ridges and dark dorsal leopard spots ringed in a light color. Two of their lookalikes are the boreal chorus frog, who are smaller, smooth, with no ridges, and have a dark stripe from nose through the eye to their hip, and three dark stripes that may be broken down their back. Then there is the wood frog in the far that can be seen in the far right corner. They also have a light belly and ridges, but they have a dark, thick eye mask with a light stripe underneath. The, leopard, uh, the northern leopard frogs' threats are habitat loss from wetland drainage, degradation, fragmentation, eutrophication, as well as human collection, the use of pesticides and non-native species of plants and fish being present and diseases. Lastly, I will mention the monarch butterfly who has a status of special concern. You can ID them by their body having white stripes and spots and their wing margins have many defined spots. Their lookalike is the Viceroy and their body is completely black. So no spots or stripes like the Monarch. Although um, they do have spots on their wings, but way fewer. And they have a strong black line that runs through their wing vein. A cool fact, the monarch butterfly's migration takes several generations to complete, which always amazes me <laughs> thinking about it. The monarch's habitat needs to contain the plant milkweed. They only lay eggs on milkweeds and, they, and the produced larvae only feed on milkweeds. So again, the milkweed is very important for their reproduction. and they are in decline due to habitat loss from logging, agriculture, and urban development, as well as pesticide use affects milkweeds and wildflowers. This slide just shows some of our other species at risk in our province, and I will hopefully highlight some of them that are present. We have the Great Plains toad and the tiger salamander. The Mormon meadowlark. The Ord's kangaroo rat. The swift fox, the American badger, an Eastern yellow-bellied racer, uh, a greater short-horned lizard, a barn swallow, 
uh, Bobo link. Chestnut collared Larkspur. A common Nighthawk. A horned grebe and a short-eared owl. Okay, so what can you do to help protect our prairie species at risk? If you see one of these species, please call the hoot line and report the sighting. Then we're able to collect that data. You can also help to reduce many of the threats that we discussed today. So when you're driving along those roads, please drive carefully, watch for birds, especially in late summer when those juvenile burrowing owls are out hunting, as well as keeping an eye out for shrikes as well. If you see rare plants, please leave them where they are. Many of those plants have very specific needs and will die if removed. Orchids are very susceptible to that. So if they're in an area where you are concerned about them, please just report them and then we can monitor those populations. You can also help by planting native species to avoid this, helping the spread of invasive species such as baby's breath. And making sure you're not driving vehicles on beaches. As Carmen was saying, it's very easy to run over those nests. There was actually at least two that were lost last year due to that. And keeping dogs and pets leashed when on beaches to make sure they're also not destroying those nests for those piping plovers. If you're in those areas, cleaning up your garbage will help to avoid attracting predators. You can also plant milkweeds to help those monarchs out. And if you see one of these species on your property, please consider becoming a steward, contact us, and help to protect that species going forward. We would like to thank everyone for watching today, as well as PCAP for hosting us, and of course, all of our sponsors. And we can answer questions now. That was really great, uh, Carmen and Rachel. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, you are welcome to type them in to the question box. Um, the first one is, what is the contact info for stewardship and the hoot line? So the number for the hoot line is that uh, it is 1-800-667-HOOT. And you can also email outreach at naturesask.ca. Or if it's a burrowing owl, you could email obo at naturesask.ca. We can also too share the, uh, the number with you guys later. There aren't any questions yet, um, but if someone was interested in joining one of the SOS programs um, and they weren't aware of a species at risk on their land, but maybe like a historical sighting, would they still be able to join? Yes, um, of course, first you can always call that hoot line to be like, I have an ideal habitat or I know that um, there have been um, species present before, they just might not be here right now. Um, and we would love to come out and talk with you. And yeah, uh, the more the merrier, and it would just be awesome to get you all a part of it and be partners. Well, here's one. Uh, we see tiger salamanders around our place. This is from Anne. And depend, depending on the year, 
do you just want like the GPS point sent to you? That would be lovely, yes. But you would also accept like the quarter section. Correct, because I was gonna be like, or the quarter section that they're on. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever pretty much you would like to share with us and that we can always then contact you for if we can't seem to navigate, but we're pretty good at that. <laughs> Um, Shauna says that this morning she discovered a badger as a home on her property. Ooh, exciting. Can be, anyways. <laughs> be able to watch them. Um, so there aren't any other questions, but um, do either of you have um, a favorite out of the um, the umbrella species for the programs? That is a hard one. Rachel, do you want to talk first? I think it's still a little early in our summer to definitively have a favorite. Uh, I have found the burrowing owls quite exciting because with coming from Calgary, there's some burrowing owl programs that are based out of the Calgary Zoo. So it's very interesting to be able to actually get out and see them. However, I also quite enjoy the loggerhead shrikes. Uh, they are really cute. And then also do the impalements, which is a funny combination. It's kind of cool to see. I've yet to see an impalement in person, but this summer. And I agree, it is too early to say, but right now the piping plovers have my heart. <laughs> so, but you know, I'm open. I'm open for changes. Uh, <laughs> And actually a, a cool um, little thing, if anyone was ever interested in knowing how we got those uh, bird calls or sounds, the Merlin app is a really good one uh, to hear and like get your ears tuned um, to listen, listen out on your guys' properties, so. Yes, awesome, thank you. Uh, Brianna asks, will there be volunteer events this year for any of the programs? Hopefully. That would be one that would be better answered by Rebecca or Caitlin. I'm not sure where we're at right now with COVID for any volunteer events. Hi, yes, uh, Rebecca here. Uh, Yes, that's a, that's a great question, and um, maybe later in the summer, but right now uh, we're still just following all uh, Saskatchewan Health Authority's guidelines, and it is just, we, we don't really have any events. We did just hold the World Migratory Bird Day event that was by um, by registration only, and there were volunteers engaged in that, so if you are interested in volunteering, please reach out to us at, you can go to the website, you can go on social media, you can call the Hoot Line, and we will do our best to get you connected to what you're most interested in. Awesome, thanks Becky. Uh, there's a question from Carol. What kind of security is there for locations of reported endangered species, since some people might have nefarious interests? Yes, so exact locations of those species are not shared except with the Conservation Data Center. And we will just list general locations if we're talking about something like that. We don't publish any of those because we are wanting to protect those species at risk. So if you see one and are posting it on social media or anything like that, it is recommended not to have a very descriptive location added to it because we do want to make sure that there's they're not getting swamped by a ton of people wanting to go up and see them. Yeah, we do have just a piggyback off of Rachel. Um, we do have a privacy policy. Um, therefore, the land um, owner will be talked to first if we ever wanted to put it through the SASC CDC, anything like that. It would go through you first and your comfortable uh, level of comfort. So no nothing else is shared. Great, thank you. Uh, Terry asks, do you only work with private landowners or do you also work with industries such as oil and gas companies that may interact with habitat? 
and SARA listed uh, species. So we are also able to work with land managers and property managers. So both owners and managers of that land can sign up for the programs. So if there's someone who's managing that land and spots that species at risk and is interested in signing up, you can absolutely still reach out and we are still able to do that. Thank you. Um, does Angie asks, does Nature Saskatchewan collect siting data from eBird? That I'm, might be a question that's better yeah, asked like, to Rebecca or Caitlin. Sure, uh, Rebecca here. Um, I'll just say that uh, all the information, all the data that we collect uh, feeds into the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre and eBird uh, Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre does get all the information from eBird as well. So it is going to the proper people to be uh, to be recorded and for monitoring purposes. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, is there a trail book for identification or an app that you would recommend? Some common ones are iNaturalist. So that's one that can be used for a wide variety, including plants, birds, and animals. Uh, if you're wanting to do bird identification, eBird, as mentioned, is also a really good one for that. And Merlin, uh, and so those both work together quite well for identification and kind of a guide to have with you. Great, thank you. Um, Sherry asks, are landowners able to have their land assessed by someone to see if it is of ecological value or if there are species at risk present? I don't know the full answer to that, but I'm assuming yes, because we would uh, we would love to have be in partnership and um, maybe our coordinators could uh, pop in extra. but. Uh, if you're curious, I, I would say give us an email, give us a call, and we could talk to you personally and um, check in with that. You're right, Carmen. You're absolutely right. So if you're if you're at all uh, curious and and uh, are are wondering and would like your land um, like someone to help you out, just reach out to us. And and if we can't, we we will uh, connect you with the right people that can. So please reach out, and we'll we'll take it from there and help you out. Okay. So I think there's just one last question from Debbie. How do we know where the animals are located to be able to avoid them or to be careful? Um, our areas posted. For example, piping plover nesting sites are burrowing owl sites. Um, so, uh, as we mentioned, we do keep specific locations confidential because we don't want those areas getting swarmed by people. However, those habitats that we mentioned today, so if you're worried about like piping plover beaches, if it's a beach that's sandy, kind of gravelly, and has a nice wide beach that is a potential location if you are in that area just keep an eye out where you're stepping again making sure you're not driving on the beach or not having pets unleashed on those areas that look like they could be likely plover habitat to making sure you're protecting that if you are wandering close to a nest chances are you will actually see an adult bird before you were to get right up to it as Carmen mentioned they do that broken wing behavior so you would likely see the adult before you got up to a nest and then you would know to be extra careful where you're stepping or just move away from the area. If you're looking for burrowing owls, where you're likely going to see those is often up on fence posts. But as I said, watching the roadways, especially in late August, when they are more likely to be out on the roads, is going to be a big one for that. Anything to add, Carmen? Um, I, I think you covered it. Um, a lot of times you'll, um, for especially the plovers, you'll hear them before you see them. And then you'll be able to know, oh, maybe not go in that area. Um, and yeah, for the owls, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and look, if you're wondering for the shrikes, sometimes it's the impalements will give their approximate location away. So just keep your ear, ears out, eyes peeled, and 
yeah, hopefully you'll see one. Trikes you will often see sitting up high in shrubbery as well in that, like a lot of the pictures that we showed, more of that thorny shrubbery, especially in the more dead stuff, you'll see them sitting up high on those shrubs. That's a good spot to watch for the shrikes as well as along the fences. Awesome. So those are all the questions we have. I just want to thank you both again so much for doing this presentation for us today. It was really great. Um, I think it's good to have that like basic species at risk information out there for people to be aware and to learn more about them. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, if you want to watch the pre this presentation again, it is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. And um, once we close out of this webinar, you will be asked to um, answer a few questions on a participant survey. So if you have any um, advice or suggestions on uh, upcoming webinars or anything like that, that's where you can put in those tidbits of information. Um, and if there's anything related to the species or locations, I can just forward to the Nature Sask folks so that they can get that information. And uh, with that, I hope everyone has a good day and uh, happy Native Prairie Appreciation Week. Thank you guys. Thank you for hosting us.